Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I will be doing another Kahoot, and I'm going to be going over congestive heart failure. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it, so go ahead and press that like button now. Give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews and one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. You can reserve your spot right now by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. While you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available. Those audio lessons, I made them specifically for current nursing students. If you are struggling in the nursing program right now and you have to get a really high grade on your next exam, I encourage you to check out those audio lessons I have available. Again, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, guys, let's get started. Congestive heart failure. First question, your patient's hyperkalemic. You should withhold the next dose of which medication? Would it be furosemide, captopril, metoprolol, or acetaminophen? Your patient is hyperkalemic. Which next dose would you withhold? Which next dose would you not give? Furosemide, which is Lasix, captopril, which is capitin, metoprolol, which is toprox, or acetaminophen, which is Tylenol? Which one is it? Wow. Let's talk about this, guys. So most of you went with furosemide, Lasix. Furosemide, this is um, a potassium losing diuretic, right? That L in Lasix is for losing. That It makes you lose potassium, right? So if you give a patient furosemide, you give them Lasix, you don't expect them to have hyperkalemia, you would expect them to have the opposite. You expect that patient to be hypokalemic if they would be anything. So that's definitely not the answer. The correct answer, guys, is captopril. Um, if you've been following me for any amount of time, I told you the story, how you can remember those medications that end in pril. Those are ACE inhibitors. My nemesis in nursing program, her name was April, and she always aced her exam. So pril, ACE inhibitor. Anyway, um, ACE inhibitors, have the ability to cause hyperkalemia. So if you see, by the way, um, the potassium range is 3.5 to 5. That is your normal therapeutic range. It's a very narrow therapeutic range. Anything outside of that range can cause your patient to have cardiac dysrhythmias, right? Okay. Now, if you uh, see that the patient is on this type of medication, they're on an ACE inhibitor, and you look at the labs and you see your page, patient's potassium is higher than five, your patient's hyperkalemic, you better not give that captopril. You better hold that medication and place a phone call to the healthcare provider because you understand your patient's already hyperkalemic and that captopril can cause the potassium to go even higher. And we don't want our patient to have any cardiac issues. Okay. Your patient with congestive heart failure has AFib and is taking Coumadin, that's warfarin. What is expected outcome? Do you expect to see increased cardiac overload? Do you expect to see decreased cardiac overload? Do you expect to see the cardiac rhythm regulated? Or do you expect to see thrombus formation prevented? Patients taking Coumadin, what do you expect? Increased cardiac overload, decreased cardiac overload, a regulated cardiac rhythm, or prevention of thrombus formation? Very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer. When it comes to this medication, guys, this is an anticoagulant and you expect um, the development of a clot to basically be the action. It prevents a thrombus formation. You should be alert for signs and symptoms of ditch toxicity if you know which serum level. Your patient's taking digoxin. You should suspect that the patient's in digoxin toxicity if you notice which serum level, low sodium, high glucose, high calcium, or low potassium. If you're on the live and you weren't able to get into the room, just go ahead and type your answer on the live. You can still participate. 
Good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer. Low, low potassium. Low potassium can cause dig toxicity. That is absolutely the correct answer. I see uh, 11 of you guys chose low sodium. I'm not sure if you're thinking about lithium. When it comes to lithium, we're concerned about hyponatremia because hyponatremia can cause lithium toxicity, but hypokalemia can cause digoxin or dig toxicity. Make sure you guys know the difference so you don't mix them up. Which would be an indication to you that your patient with heart failure is developing pulmonary edema? Would it be distended jugular veins? Would it be anorexia? Would it be coarse crackles? Or would it be tachycardia? Which would be an indication to you that your patient with heart failure is developing pulmonary edema? Distended jugular veins, anorexia, coarse crackles, or tachycardia? Okay. Most of you guys chose the correct answer, which is coarse crackles, but on the live, all of you guys were choosing distended jugular veins. So let's talk about this. Your patient's got heart failure. They're holding on to way too much fluid. The heart cannot effectively pump out oxygenated blood because it's just too much, right? Now, this is what's happening with our patient. They have heart failure. How can we know? What is a sign or symptom that they're now developing pulmonary embolism, uh, embolism, pulmonary edema? Well, think about it, guys. If the patient's holding on to this fluid and the heart cannot effectively pump out all that fluid to go to the body, guess what? That blood, all that fluid is going to back up. It backs up and backs up and backs up. And where's it going to go? The only place it can go to the lungs. So how could you tell what are the signs and symptoms that all of that fluid has now backed up into the lungs? Coarse crackles. When you listen to the lungs, the lungs are supposed to be clear, right? But if you're hearing coarse crackles, what's causing the crackles? The fluid. Are you ever supposed to have fluid in your lungs? Absolutely not. Now, I see a lot of you guys on the live. You chose distended jugular veins. Oh, thank you for all the likes, guys. I appreciate it. Let's talk about this. Do not get confused. The pulmonary edema with right-sided heart failure, because eventually that left-sided heart failure will turn into right-sided heart failure, and that fluid is going to end up just going into the body. So distended jugular veins, um, ascites, pitting edema, all of those are signs and symptoms we'll see in that patient with right-sided heart failure. But this question is asking specifically about pulmonary edema, and so it's going to be the coarse crackles, okay? Your patient has heart failure complicated by pulmonary edema. Which of the following would you assess first? Would it be the blood pressure, skin breakdown, the serum potassium, or the urine, urine output? What are you going to check first? Your patient has heart failure and is complicated by pulmonary edema. Are you going to check first the blood pressure, skin, skin breakdown, serum potassium, or urine output? Okay, very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer and it's blood pressure. I want you to think about what's happening in the body. If you guys can understand the pathophysiology, you'll be able to answer so many questions because it makes sense, right? Patient is holding on to way too much fluid and that's why the heart can't pump effectively. We got that. What is blood pressure? All blood pressure is, is the force that's being exerted against the vessels. The more fluid, the more force the more force, the higher your blood pressure to the fact that that patient can go into hypertensive crisis. So that better be the first thing you're checking first, right? I see 10 of you guys chose um, urine output. You do want to check urine output. That's important because if the patient's holding on to all this fluid, they're not letting go of any of the fluid. That makes it even worse. But if you have to choose one answer, I want this is how I want you guys to think. If you can only choose one answer, say to yourself, what will kill my patient the fastest or keep them alive the longest? And when you look at these choices, it's blood pressure all day, every day, baby. Okay? Select all that applies. Which diagnosis would be most appropriate for a patient with systolic 
heart failure. Select all that applies. Your choices, ineffective perf uh, tissue perfusion, decreased, related to decreased stroke volume, activity intolerance related to impaired gas exchange, dyspnea related to impaired gas exchange, increased cardiac output related to increased cardiac filling, and impaired renal perfusion related to decreased cardiac output. And the last choice is Professor D. I have no clue. I give up. What do you think? Okay. I'm happy no one gave up. No one chose purple. So let's talk about um, the correct answer. And most of you guys went with the correct answer. So let's go, let's go with it. First one, ineffective tissue perfusion related to decreased stroke volume. What is perfusion? Perfusion is how much the organs and tissues are being fed the oxygen, vitamins, mineral, nutrients that are being carried in the blood. That's what perfusion means. So it makes sense that the perfusion is ineffective because of decreased stroke volume. Patients holding on to too much fluid. You have decreased stroke volume. They're not, there's not enough of the oxygenated blood going to the tissue. So it makes sense that there's going to be decreased perfusion. So that's true. Remember guys, when it comes to select all that applies, the key to answering them correctly is to treat each and every answer choice as a true or false. So that's what we're going to do. So the first one is true. Next, let's go to this one. Impaired intolerance related to impaired gas exchange. True. Think about it. The patient with CHF, the oxygenated blood is decreased going to the tissues. You got all that oxygenated blood backing, back, backing, 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 backing up, going where? Into the lungs where that fluid is not supposed to be. So you better believe, yes, that patient has impaired gas exchange. And if they have impaired gas exchange, they're going to have activity intolerance. Why? Because every activity you do requires what? Oxygen. Every time you move, your better, your metabolic rate increases. Every time you move, anytime you do something, the demand for oxygen increases. So anytime a patient's moving about, their body's going to be demanding oxygen. And if it doesn't have that oxygen, they're going to have activity intolerance. That makes sense. So that's true. We're going to keep that. Let's move on to the next choice. Dyspnea, that's difficulty breathing. Dyspnea related to impaired gas exchange. Well, we've already established that this patient has um, impaired gas exchange. So it makes sense. Yeah, they're going to have difficulty breathing. It makes sense. True. Now let's look at the one in green, which is false. Increased cardiac output. Stop right there. We know cardiac output is what? Decreased related to increased cardiac filling. So we know that's wrong. Let's keep going. Next one, impaired renal perfusion related to decreased cardiac output. We know that's true. Because remember, the problem is there's so much fluid, the heart cannot pump effectively to all of the tissues. And what organs? Is it the kidney and organ? Well, you have two kidneys. So aren't your kidneys organs? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely. You guys know I can't talk. You know I can't talk. So anyway, with decrease of oxygenated blood going to your kidneys, of course, there's going to be decreased perfusion. So that's true. How are you guys doing on the live? All right, let's keep going. You suspect that your patient has heart failure. How should you position that patient? Low fowlers, high fowlers, sideline, or prone? You suspect that your patient has heart failure. How are you going to position that patient? Are you going to place them in low fowlers, high fowlers, sideline, or prone? Okay, very good. High fowlers. How do we know high fowlers? Whenever there is a condition that we expect the patient to have respiratory issues, you're going to put them high fowlers. Why? Why? You want gravity to help 
keep the diaphragm down so that the lungs can expand as much as possible. You want to help that patient to breathe. So you're going to sit them up high fowlers. Your patient has both heart failure and pulmonary edema. What should be the major goal of therapy for this type of patient? Would it be to increase the cardiac output? Would it be to improve respiratory status? Would it be to decrease peripheral edema? Or would it be to enhance the patient's comfort? Patients got heart failure and pulmonary edema. What's the goal of therapy? I know you guys are gonna give me a heart attack. You guys did exactly what I set you up to do. And let me tell you something. This is what NCLEX does. This is what your nursing exams do to you. And you keep falling for it. You're not a robot. You cannot just choose oxygen or choose respirations just because it's there. It has to make sense. So let me get this right. Let's make sure we're on the same page here. Our patient has heart failure and pulmonary edema. And you're trying to tell me that the goal of therapy for the patient that has both of these is to improve their respiratory status. Okay, improving their respiratory status, that's gonna help with the pulmonary edema, but did we just magically forget that our patient also has heart failure? But guess what? If we chose increased cardiac output, guess what that does? That also improves the patient's respiratory status. Do you guys on the live see what I'm saying to you here? You cannot just choose respiratory status or respirations or oxygen because it's there. It has to make sense. Look at the clinical picture. Your patient has both heart failure and pulmonary edema. You see that this answer right here, increased cardiac output, this is an umbrella answer. If you've been following me for any amount of time, I've talked to you about umbrellas. An umbrella protects you from the rain. It covers you, right? An umbrella answer is the correct answer that includes another correct answer. So as a student, you should have been between blue and red, blue and red, blue and red. But if you understood the physiological, the physiologic status of what's happening here, okay? You would have said to yourself, well, the problem with this patient, the reason they're having the respiratory issue is because of the heart failure. And I know if I increase that contractility of the heart, that heart's able to push out more fluid, it's not gonna back into the lungs. So it's gonna also do what? Improve that patient's respiratory status. And it's going to help with both the heart failure and the pulmonary edema. Don't fall for it guys, make the mistake with me now. So when you're sitting in front of that test, you don't make the same mistake again. All right, your patient's receiving digoxin. You would determine the effectiveness of this drug by assessing what? Would it be dilated coronary arteries? Would it be increased myocardial contractility? Would it be decreased cardiac arrhythmias? Or would it be decreased conductivity of the heart? Anyone gets this wrong, I'm gonna have a heart attack because I literally just gave you the answer when I was giving you the rationale for the last question. Don't let me down, guys. Ah, oh, you guys are wonderful. Thank you. You want to increase the myocardial contractility. You want to increase the force, the strength of the contraction so it pushes out more oxygenated blood to the tissues so that blood does it back up and go into the lungs. Good job, guys. You're administering furosemide intravenously. How long after administration would you expect diuresis to occur? Would it be one to three minutes? five to 10 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes, or two to four hours. If you're giving Lasix IV, how long after administration of that Lasix do you expect diuresis to occur? One to three minutes, five to 10 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes, or two to four minutes. Okay. The correct answer is five to 10 minutes. Within five to 10 minutes, 
um, you should expect to see diuresis start to occur. One to three minutes is way too soon. It's five to 10 minutes. Um, most of you guys chose 30 to 60 minutes. Actually, 30 to 60 minutes is the, the peak time that we'll see of that of um, that medication working, okay? And no one chose two to four hours, great. But just a FYI, two to four hours, that's around the duration. That's how long you expect that medication to be effective once it's administered. But once it's administered, you expect to see diuresis happen in around five to 10 minutes after administration. What's the primary reason your patient is instructed to take furosemide in the morning? Is it to prevent sodium imbalance? Is it to slow the drug absorption time? Is it to promote excretion of fluid during the night? I spelled fluid wrong, sorry. Or is it to prevent sleep disturbances during the night? Why would you instruct your patient to take furosemide in the morning? Very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer because we don't want them getting up in the middle of the night to go urinate. They're, they're drowsy from sleeping. They might fall. It's all your fault because you want to be a hot mess and give your patient a diuretic at nighttime. That makes absolute no sense. So you're going to teach them to take it in the morning. You don't want them getting up in the middle of the night to urinate. All right, last question. You're teaching your patient about the signs and symptoms of dig toxicity. What would you include? Rash, hypertension, increased appetite, or visual disturbances? What would you say a sign or symptom of digoxin toxicity is? Very good. Visual disturbances. The patient may complain of things like, you know, blurred vision or like um, yellow spots or yellow haze. All right. Let's see how you guys did.